So, um, we're on chapter seven. And the first thing I want to do is, man, I just noticed this course. There's a free course from Troy Hunt, who is a Microsoft-oriented security researcher about web security in Australia. And this is very good. And I've been going through some of these lessons. So I highly recommend it. It's linked chapter 7J. It doesn't seem to have any hands-on projects, though. It's just lectures. And he made a couple of websites where you can demonstrate things. It covers a lot of what's in this course. And it does it from the Microsoft point of view. So you see it all in ASP. He uses Fiddler instead of Burp. Fiddler is Microsoft's proxy tool, which it does approximately the same thing and is also free. Um, and he uses IE a lot and talks about some IE specific stuff, which is interesting. So, you know, you, it's, um, it's very good and he had a lot of nice demonstrations. So I highly recommend this as a supplementary bit of material, but the overall content is pretty much the same. I think. <coughs> um, anyway, so session management is what we're up to. Session management is how you keep track of who somebody is as they make multiple requests since HTTPS um, does not have any intrinsic state. If you request a page and then you click a link and request the next page, it does not remember who you are. So you have to add in something external to keep track of who you are, and that should be a session, and the session should be a data structure on the server which remembers who you are with something like an ID number, and this should be connected to something that the user sends up like a cookie that tells them who they are. So if you could uh, somehow find the session token and somehow defeat this process, then you could be, be interpreted as somebody else at the server and get in somebody else's account. That's the point here. So you can have privilege escalation vertically up to administrator or horizontally over to another user. And this might be as simple as just value, uh, incrementing a token. If the token is simple, the first user is user number 1,000, next user is 1,001, next user is 1,002. So if you just change the number, you'll be in somebody else's account. So you try to be less predictable than that. Google used to use this system. Um, Google, I was, I was on the wall sheep at DEF CON because I used Gmail on DEF CON wireless, which I thought was safe because the login page was HTTPS, but I failed to notice that the future pages at that time were not HTTPS. So at, your password was sent, encrypted, and not easily stolen, but the cookie that identified you later was easily stolen and replayed, and the tool they used was hamster and ferret. You can also do it with Wireshark and Python and pretty much anything else. And they got my token, they got my account, and I was on a wall of sheep. And I said, well, it's a fair cop. I learned something I didn't know. And a couple of years later, Google upgraded to 100% HTTPS all the time, so you can't do this anymore unless you actually penetrate HTTPS, which is much harder to do. It's not impossible. But actually, if you're using Chrome, it's well nigh impossible these days, because even if you use SSL strip, Chrome will refuse to load the page insecurely. So you need state. In Web 1.0, there was no state, no login. You just viewed pages and images, and they just sit there. But that was no fun. We wanted email and Facebook and Twitter and everything. So we want people to log in. And then we want each person to see their own account, which is different than other people's accounts. So we need to have a session. All right, um, even if you don't have a login, there's still reasons to keep track of the page, for example, to target ads and to uh, let you put things in a shopping cart and so on. There's still a reason why the page you're seeing is not equal to the same page everybody else is seeing frequently, even if you didn't log in. So you have a session token. It might be like this. It's typically in a cookie. So when you log in or connect to the server, at some point when you become unique to the server, it sends you a cookie. They'll have a set cookie command that will give it the name of a cookie and then a value of the cookie. And then it can have some flags like a lifetime and HTTP only and secure, or it might not bother with any of that. And if it doesn't fill in anything else, then this cookie will only be held until you close your browser and then discard it. But that might be fine. So this is an ASP.NET cookie generated by this ASP application. So the response from the server sets the cookie, your browser remembers it, and every response back to the same domain, it sends that cookie. So now the server knows who you are. All right, so there are various ways to do this wrong. The most obvious one is if you don't generate the token unpredictably enough, then people can guess somebody else's token. And if you don't handle the token carefully, somebody can steal somebody else's token. Those are the basic vulnerabilities. Now, one thing that can happen is there might be a whole lot of cookies and other values, and you don't know which one of them really matters. There's often a lot of peripheral values flying around in cookies that really don't matter much. So, Burp Repeater is very good for this. So let's, let's try it at Hackazon and then at Amazon. I've got Firefox here. And if I go to Hackazon, all right, now I should be, I've got, I'm running Burp. Okay, so let's take a look at Burp. Here's Burp. And if you go down to the end, here's my Hackazon. I found out how to make the font somewhat bigger in Burp, so it should be a little better for 
remote viewer has been in this room, I think they can blow up things and such. Anyway, so here I am. Uh, my Hackathon request has a CDF UID, a visited products and a PHP session ID. And now let me log into Hackathon. I'm not logged in right now, so I think it's uh, Sam Test. Sam Test, I think so. Okay, now I'm logged in as somebody. So let's see what happened there. I did a post to user login. And when I did, I sent it a username and a password, Sam Test, which, by the way, was sent unencrypted over the internet because this is a pretty miserable website. And the response um, did not appear to set a cookie. So maybe it just, I think it just used the existing PHP SES ID, is how it determined me, which is randomly created by PHP. So now I'm in. Now if I go to a a personalized page, it's here in the session. So let me just open a page that I can tell if I'm logged in, like your account, my profile, for example. There, I see my name, Sam Test. I can blow this up. So now that's a personalized page. That's what you want. So it must have known who I was to get that page. And I'm just going to clear the history because I'm not seeing what I expect to see here. Let me refresh this page. There we are. And here's my get account. Okay, that's what I wanted to see. This page in the response, if I render it, it should tell me that I'm Sam somewhere. There, my account. Um, there, username Sam Test. Okay, that's what I want to see. A page where there is a request and I can tell it's personalized. So that means I can now find out what part of this cookie matters. So I right click and send to repeater. Now in the repeater, I have the original request here, and I'm just going to show the headers. And are there parameters? There are parameters. Let's show parameters. Now if I send that, <coughs> and render this, and then scroll down, I wonder if I can zoom in. Looks like I can't zoom in, but anyway, uh, that's showing Sam test. So I'm plugged in. So now I just try deleting things, like CFDUID. I'm pretty sure that's Cloudflare. I don't think that matters. Let's remove that one and resend it. And it turns out, if I do that, I'm still logged in as Sam Test. So that cookie was not the identifier. This visited products, I'm pretty sure I don't need that because that looks like that's my shopping cart or something. If I remove that and replay, I'm probably still logged in. And I am, username Sam Test. So it's pretty much this session ID. Let's try that. If I remove that session ID and send this request, now, I don't get a visible page at all. I get some kind of error, 302. So um, it's 302 found, but it didn't send me any data. So that's good. I'm not, I can't see that page when I'm not logged in. You're not allowed to see anybody's profile. So it was the session ID, the PHP session ID is what maintains a Hackazon session. Now let's take a look at Amazon, the real Amazon. Amazon.com. It's HTTPS, but I've configured my Firefox to have a root certificate from Burke, so it will let me do any HTTPS connection accepting the fake certificates. So I'm in here to Amazon, and I'm actually logged in as SamCCSF. Looks like I made an account. I forget, but I think I did it for this class. So I have actually a page, SamCCSF's Amazon. I have signed up for account. So I'm logged in right now. So let's take a look at the requests that caused this. And Amazon is much more complicated, as you might imagine. Um, here's your account. That looks pretty good. So the response... Uh, get your account navigation. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to clear the history to make my life simple. And then I'm just going to refresh a page with my name on it so I get a minimal amount of data. And even that is probably pretty large, but I'm hoping maybe the first one. Uh, no content. Get home page. Ah, this one has a page. And if I render it, it has my name there, Sam CCSF's Amazon. Okay, so here's a request that went to the server and Amazon recognized me. So something in that request identified me. So let's play with this one. If you copy this to the repeater, I can go to the repeater and I'm just gonna remove these other ones from Hackazon, I don't need them. Okay, here it is. And as I, I just wanted to do this to show you, it is pretty complicated because Amazon is not messing around. And they have a bunch of business partners and advertisers and all sorts of things in here. So this could be the session token, or it could be this session ID up here, or this XWL ID, or maybe this CSM hit. It could be almost anything. So I spent some time trying these, and I don't want to 
do it by trial and error here. I saved the result in my slides, so I, I'm just going to demonstrate it. Um, I found out in Amazon, the original Crest had all this jazz in it, but all you really need is the X main. All the rest of it does not identify you. It does something else, like target ads. So here's the X main. So I should be able to delete all of them and send that. And if I render it, it will hopefully still know who I am. And did it test it? I don't see, oh, there, CSF, Amazon dashboard. It's there. OK, and if I delete all this, it will also still know who I am. All that junk doesn't matter right now. Send that. And it's still Sam CSF's Amazon dashboard. So this one cookie is what determines my, um, my session. And as you can see, it's a really long blob of base 64. Now, if you wanted to see how security is, you could copy it and try to reverse it. And I think it's just random, which is what it should be. It shouldn't be your name and password or anything uh, recognizable. Just to, for completeness, let's remove that. And now when I send a request, I'm going to get your account, but not your name. So now it's forgot who I am. So now I've found the session token for Amazon, which is that long blob of base 64 stuff. So I'm not going to be able to exploit it unless I find some weakness involving that, like I'm able to predict that number or I'm somehow able to steal that number from somebody else. So that's how you narrow it down with Burp. So there are other ways to do it besides sessions. You can have other technologies that just send your identity up every time you connect. And uh, the original web had this thing called basic authentication that sends your username and password with every request in base64 encoding, which is pretty terrible. But the original web was pretty security terrible. Uh, then there's digest authentication that sends an MD5 hash, which is not much better. And there's NTLM authentication for Microsoft NT networks, which automatically sends an NT hash up, which is also pretty terrible. All those are pretty weak and old, and they're not that common anymore. They're mostly used for internal LANs running Microsoft systems, not much on the web. None of them are really secure enough for modern web use, although if you do use one of these over HTTPS, it's reasonably secure because that adds a layer of encryption on the outside that makes up for the deficiencies of the encryption on the inside. Um, but they're just not popular. So uh, your application might not issue session tokens or manage the state, so what it'll do is send everything to the client, and every time the client requests anything, it'll send it back. This is commonly done, and it's the heart of a whole lot of the vulnerabilities we exploit, but it can be reasonably secure if you use a careful enough way to do it, like the ASP.NET view state. ASP is designed for this, and you can write a page. Here's a page in C, Sharp, which is one of Microsoft's languages, and you can define an array of items, and you can add those items to a view state in this code using a library of, of functions Microsoft gives you. And then you can store anything in there, strings, integers, array objects, hash tables, custom type converters. You can take all the data you want and stick it in this blob of data called a view state. This is called serializing it. You'll hear a lot about that throughout this course. Um, taking data and serializing it means boiling it down to just a linear string of characters or hexadecimal digits, which can now be stuck in one object like a cookie. That's what they call it. So now you have view state, which includes all those facts about you. And um, this data can, you can turn off the protection in view state, and then it's just like base64 encoded and not protected. Or you can have a hash value at the end. It's not encrypted, but it does have a hash value, which includes a secret. And the secret includes your MAC address from your machine. So you can't copy it and use it on another machine. And you can't alter anything about it without it failing the test at the other end. So that's the point of this. A validated view state is considered quite secure. It doesn't hide the data, but you can tell if someone makes a request whether they're sending you a valid unaltered view state or not because of the hash value. Yeah? Have they made um, improvement in a different version of the ASP? This, I understand, is the later version, although your book is getting pretty old. There may be some improvements after this. But there's nothing wrong with this one. If you actually use the MAC value, that's considered pretty good. You shouldn't be putting secrets in the token. But now, nobody can really mess with the token because there's a, a real hash, and it uses a real secret key. So it's not you can't reasonably brute force it or forge it um, under normal conditions. All right, so um, see. There, if you want to see if they're using session less like states, then you'll find some kind of token that's 100 bytes long of random junk. And it's going to have a new token like for every request. The data may be encrypted, meaningful data, or it might just be signed, or it might be structureless random numbers. 
And uh, if you try to submit the same token with more than one request, it'll be rejected because it has something like a time signature or something to prevent replay. Those are clues that it is not really maintaining a session state on the server. It is taking that as your ID card, that blob of data. So generating the token is now important. Um, this I thought was awesome. This came out like two days ago. This guy got $15,000 for this hack. And I thought it would be particularly inspiring to this class because he did exactly what you're doing for homework. Um, 129S, this should be right at the bottom of the page. Uh, is it opening or what? OK. Um, there we are. This guy made a video of what he did. And it should look pretty common, look pretty real uh, normal to you. OK, here's his video. He got burp. He paid for the professional version. This is the only difference between what he's doing and what you do. He went to Facebook, and he found the password reset page. And the password reset has a six-digit code that they send to your phone. So if you could try all possible six digits, which is not impossible, you would make it. But he found that the Facebook page does have some timeout. You can only try some guesses, and it doesn't let you guess anymore. But there's something called beta.facebook.com that doesn't have that protection. And yet it has access to the real data. So we just went into Burp Suite, and you can go into the uh, Burp Intruder and just try all the numbers. And he got into an account that way. He just brute forced the six-digit number because they forgot to put um, timeout session control of so many guesses on the beta version. So they paid him 15000 bucks for that. And this is what it amounts to. You just have to find the door they left open somewhere, some place there's a few controls you ought to have, and someplace they will have forgot to put the control there, and now you can sail in. So um, that's it. And that's why um, I, an NCC group sent me a message through one of the students that, that got an internship. They say they would like to take anybody for a paid internship if they've been through your textbook. They say, that is enough. If you understand what's in that textbook, they want to hire you right now as a pen tester to pen test web apps. This, that's why I'm still using it, even though that book is getting kind of old. And people have said, I think that book is old, and yet every time I do a real engagement, the stuff we find is really in that book. Everything that you can do is, is in there. So anyway, so it's good. That's why I'm using it. And I haven't found much in the way of updates that I have to mention. So uh, you can send uh, password recovery tokens to an email. You can put them in hidden form fields. Um, this would be a way to prevent cross-site forgery. So if somebody's copied a cookie, they can replay the cookie, but they won't be playing it from the page with this other token that's different on every page, so it can tell. Like the ASP puts your MAC address in it, puts some number that other people don't have in there. Um, all right, you can use persistent tokens for remember me, and almost everybody does. And uh, you need a token to see the status of an order in a shopping cart, even if you haven't uh, logged in. Well, if, you're, if, you're, if you purchase something, yeah, but if you're, if you're just trying to see the contents of your cart, it still needs a token, even if you haven't logged in yet. So the token has to be unpredictable. One common way to make a token is to use meaningful data. This, especially if you do CTFs, you'll learn to spot this really fast. This is readable ASCII. 75 and 73 is, are uh, printable capital letters. This is a capital A. You learn a few of these, and you spot it. That's just hexadecimal for user equals DAF. Huh. 7365. Huh. That's, that should be, oh, it's hex. 41 in hex is capital A, 65 is a lowercase character. Okay, in base 10 is 65. Anyway, that's what this is. So it's user equals DAF, app equals admin, date equals something, all just turned into hex. And so that means since it's not really encrypted or random, you can generate other valid tokens, like you can change this to admin, and you might get into the admin account. Uh, that's why you should not use predictable tokens like that. Um, so ASCII, of course, you can just Google ASCII or type man ASCII at Linux or anything. There's just uh, all the characters can be typed into that. So here's things you put in structured tokens. Username, an American identifier, first and last name, email, and all that jazz. IP addresses. These are all meaningful things that you, date and time, meaningful things you might use to construct your token, but they're predictable. You can encode it with systems. The common systems are XOR, Base64, and HEX. We just looked at HEX. That's the simplest system. Once you have done HEX and turned it into binary, you then might add the XOR or Base64 to it. So here's how you find this. Obtain a SQL token, modify it, 
send that up to the server someplace like Burp Repeater and see if it will accept the modified token. Change stuff if, if it's possible. You will find that you're somebody else, not just error messages, but you'll in somebody else's account. Uh, there was a student at a college about six years ago that did this right in the URL. It had student ID equals something, so he changed that number, got in another student's account. So he told the college, they sent the cops to arrest him, fired him, revoked his degree, gave him all kinds of trouble, which is what people tend to do. Um, but he was right. That's why you want to do this for someone with a bug bounty or someone where you have permission to test. Um, otherwise, you cannot expect good results from surprising someone with a security problem. Their simple solution will be to just get rid of you. So you log in as several users, make several accounts, record the tokens, and see if you can spot a difference. I did this in an earlier class for the uh, Stitcher app. We use the password of A and AA and AA and AAB and so on, and you can spot a pattern in the tokens if they're doing something simple. So analyze the tokens, see if you can spot a pattern. A series of repeating letters can help you a lot, like AAA, if they're just doing something like encoding or XORing, or even base 64ing, if you put more there, you'll see repetitions in yeah. that stuff. Um, I know I'm so, you're adding more characters. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, one thing I've done quite a bit for Android apps is use a character, uh, password that is 32 repeating characters, mm -hmm. and then it might have others to meet their complexity requirement, and then if they're using ECB encryption, I can see blocks of repeated encryption text, mm -hmm. and many of them are. Base64 you can spot because a hex has just numbers and letters A through F. Base64 has uppercase, lowercase, and a couple of symbols like plus and slash, and often equals at the end. The equals are padding characters that occur because Base64 is six bits at a time, so you have to have three bytes that turns into four characters of Base64. And if you were to have four bytes, it would have to add two bytes of padding, and it puts two equals at the end to tell you about that. So it doesn't always have equals at the end, but like two times out of three it does. And that's a common way to spot it. But you'll spot it because it has letters like K and W and P, and it has upper and lower case, which, base, which hex does not. So once you've found a pattern, try guessing the token of another user. Find a page like I did that's session dependent, some page that shows who you are, some kind of profile page, and just send your modified tokens up there and see if you can get one of them to let you in somebody's account. So, here's some computes to do. I'm going to start Zoom to give the remote viewers a fair chance. All right, what encoding looks like that? All right, that is base64. It's got upper and lower case in it. It doesn't have equals because this is groups. This is nine characters, which is a multiple of three. So it doesn't need to pad. How do you know it's not XOR? Um, if it was X or the repeated A's would lead to repeated bytes. But I do you know like it's not XOR with the same letter. Like Oh yeah, it's not single byte XOR. It could be multi byte XOR and you wouldn't know. You're right. So this one is MD5. MD5 is this uh, 128 bits, so it's long like that. It's always the same length. And very common. Alright. And how about this one? Okay, the A's turn into 41s. That's hex. Four A's at the end just turn into 441s. And how about this one? That's XOR because the A's turn into 05, and it repeats. All right. So let me just record some winners, and we'll go on here. AC, Chad Bourne, and Jeff Tom. Good, I actually know who these people are. So predictable tokens. Um, you might be able to get a few tokens by making a few accounts or by logging in and out a few times, and then you might see a pattern. Um, there may be a commercial software product running at the other end that has a simple pattern. Uh, if you have a commercial software and you can install your own copy of it, then it's very nice because you can run it locally and do thousands of requests. If it's up to their server, you'd probably hit some kind of rate limit. Anyway, you uh, might see sequential tokens. Here, let me get rid of the sound because... Uh, People will annoy each other. All right, and uh, all right. So, uh, Burp will try sequential payloads if you want to, which you saw in that video. You can tell it to just uh, modify payloads, and then what it'll do is look at the length of the response, and it'll take the ones that are different and put them on the top, and those are ones where it got in. 
or at least it produced a different error message, but usually you're getting an invalid user until you get logged in as somebody. So all the ones that don't have the expected link are the ones that work. So you might have concealed sequences or time dependency or weak random number generators if you have something more complicated than just sequential numbers, which of course is easy. So this is a concealed sequence. This appears to be base64 encoded, and it decodes into that gibberish if you use base64, so that isn't getting you anywhere. But in fact, what you do is turn it into hexadecimal, and then it's just a numerical sequence. What it is, is it's adding, um, if you just calculate the difference between sequential numbers, it's often the same number, and when it isn't, it's a large negative number, closely related to it. So this is just adding a large constant and rolling over, and keeping the insignificant digits of a, of a fixed jump up. So um, if you just add 100,000, so it starts with that, you can see, this is actually a linear sequence. It's just adding a fixed number to each one, and then keeping only the insignificant digits of total. This is just modular arithmetic. That's what they call a concealed sequence. So it's easy to predict, and you can easily write it in base64, and this is the script that does it. This is the uh, thing that decodes it in base64, and then just adds a number and calculates the next one. It's quite easy to do in Python or any other programming language. So you can now generate valid tokens. You run them off here, and here's a nice simple Python script that does it. Um, you really don't have to do much. Then there's time dependency. The left number just goes up by one every time, and the right number goes up by some funny amount each time. I get 87, 90, 92, 97. Turns out it's counting something like milliseconds. So all you have to do is do a few of them, then wait 10 minutes and do them again. And now again, they're all going up, but now it's 648, it's jumped ahead by some thousands. Instead of uh, 642, it's now 648. So it's just counting milliseconds is all it's doing. Quite easy. 10 minutes is 600,000 milliseconds. So that second number is not random at all, and it's easy to brute force and predict. So I'll pull the expression sequently, frequently to get tokens. Um, if the first number skips one, that means somebody else logged in in between. And now you know the second number will be between the two ones you have. You guess one time, guess the other, somebody else logged in. You know when they logged in because you watched the first number change, and you have a minimum and maximum value of the time, so you can just brute force the time, and now you can get in somebody else's account. A lot of people use commercial servers that have weak random number generators. Uh, most programming languages like C and Python and Java have some convenient random number generator which they tell you not to trust, but it's the easy one to use. And so people just use it. I know in C, it doesn't seed it by default. So if you don't seed it, it always produces the same random numbers. A common mistake. So many programmers don't know this and they just use the easy random number generator which somewhere in the manual it says don't trust this random number generator but they why do you give someone something that's broken but they all do they give you a convenient one that's broken and say don't trust this one and people use it of course so often the random numbers are not really random and the linear congruential generator is one common way to do it where it is again just a straight line it's uh, calculating multiplying a number by a constant and adding a constant and then keeping the insignificant digits. So it leads to the same kind of predictability as the last one we looked at. PHP 5.3 um, created a session token from the IP address, the time in Unix epoch, which is the number of milliseconds since January 1st, 1970 or something, uh, the microseconds on the server, a token creation, and then a linear congruential generator. Uh, this is the kind of thing Dan Kaminsky recommended a few years ago at DEF CON. A, there was a big scandal that started at a Canadian re university where they did research and found a lot of public keys that were all based on the same private keys on the internet. Um, and they determined that a lot of the um, public key encryption is crackable because the numbers are not random enough. And Dan Kaminsky talked about how even though your computer doesn't have any high quality random number, you could mix several random numbers and create something a lot more random and improve it. So this is something people often do, is take several things that have some entropy. You're trying to get a lot of entropy. You're trying to get some randomness, so you try to gather it in various places. Yeah? Uh, are these RSA keys or PGP keys? Those were RSA keys. Okay. Those were used on digital certificates. Okay. But it probably applies to everything. Okay. VPN keys and everything. Everything needs to start with a random number, and yet there's no easy way to get a random number. Although, I think the i5 or the i7 now has a hardware random number generator, mm -hmm. which really produces high quality entropy if you're willing to trust them. They're using Geiger counters. Uh, no, that's one way, but this I think used, the standard way to do it is to just um, measure the Johnson noise in a resistor. 
So you put a resistor at constant current, constant voltage, and you measure the current. And the current fluctuates because of the random motion of the atoms. And that can be amplified and is considered high quality random numbers. Uh, Sammy Kamkar is a famous hacker. He made the Sammy worm that spread over MySpace, which he got in some legal trouble for. He's done a lot of stunts like that, written a lot of good tools. And he's the first guy that wrote a practical attack that um, broke into the PHP random number generators because this combination of stuff is not really enough entropy. You can brute force the entropy. He was able to actually get in. Um, so, you know, randomness is hard to define and hard to measure. Here's Dilbert's random number generator. Just gives you nine, six times, and then they say, is that random or not? And, well, you really don't know. It could be. Um, so here's how you test randomness in Burp Suite. You start with the hypothesis that things are random, then do a bunch of tests and see if it fails the test. That's all you can do. And if it passes the test, you say it appears to be random. If you find some kind of pattern, it doesn't. And Burp has a uh, automatic way to do this called Burp Sequencer. You can specify the parameter that is supposedly random, and it'll fetch a lot of them, and then do statistics and tell you which bits are random. The red bits were not random. The green bits were random. And this is uh, Microsoft has done things like this, too for their address space layout randomization and other things. They make they combine several numbers, and you can rate the result by how many real bits of entropy it has. Some bits are predictable, some bits are less predictable. In a perfect world, all 32 bits would be green, and you'd have only one chance in 2 to the 32 of getting there. In a real world, you probably don't have that much entropy, and they aren't really all independent. All right, then you can encrypt stuff. This is commonly done, although probably not very wise, as we're going to see. Um, so you take meaningful content, like the username, then you encrypt it with a secret key that the attacker doesn't know. Now, this sounds good. The problem is your encryption routines often do not do what you think they're going to do. A hashing routine might do it, but an encryption routine doesn't really remove all control of the data. One thing you can do is ECB mode, electronic codebook. This is the simple kind of encryption people use where you have blocks of data, like 8 or 16 bytes, and you encrypt each one. And if you have another block that's identical, it get the same result. This has a very, this preserves patterns. So if you encrypt that with ECB, it just turns into that. So you can still see the shape because any block of constant color just changes to another block of repeating blocks of colors. So you really haven't removed all the patterns. So here's ECB. You have a random number, an app, user ID, username, and all that jazz. You encrypt it with ECB. It looks good and random, just a bunch of random hexadecimal junk. But it's actually 8-byte blocks. So this 8-byte turns into that. This 8-byte turns into that. Now, even though you don't have the key and you can't decrypt it, you can rearrange the blocks because each one of them is independent. So copy a whole block like this one that has a 992. The user ID is 992 right now. So I copy that block and I register a new user, DAF1 and I scramble things, so I put a block here. I figure out, I take, replace it with a block from some other user, and that block might start with a 1. So now I'm UID equals 1, which is typically the administrator, because the way it usually works is you have a database. The first account you make is the administrator. Then you log in as the administrator and make all the rest. So usually the first account is the administrator. So you can, even though I can't decrypt anything, I can replace this with a block I took somewhere else and just shuffle them like dominoes until I happen to get a meaningful combination. And the reason this works is because web apps are fault tolerant. If you scramble things so the time is now 6129, even if this turns out to be like 6x or something, it is typically the case that if I get a valid user ID and an invalid time parameter, the app will keep running. This is why something you'll see at the end of every chapter, they say, what you should do is if you get any invalid data, you should reject the request. But that doesn't typically happen. You have some PHP code. It looks for parameters, does some uh, calculations on them. And it very often doesn't really test them all or use them all, like that Amazon page, where most of that junk didn't seem to be used at all. I was able to delete it and still see the page. If that was a secure page up to the standards of your book, it would not talk to me if I take away something. Yeah. So you're obviously a hacker. This was obviously not a genuine user, or all those other fields would have been there. So you can often corrupt a bunch of fields, or even have duplicate values for fields, and the app will not crash. It will just accept the part that's good. That's why it's working. Now, CBC is another mode. If you don't want that electronic codebook pattern, you use CBC. This is the most common way of doing encryption. You start with an initialization vector. You encrypt 
you XOR that with the data and encrypt that. Then you take the output and use it as the IV for the next block. XOR it with that and encrypt the data. Take the output and encrypt that. So even if the input is repeating blocks of data, the output will not be repeating. So you just get complete white noise on the output. So it looks really good. And at first glance, you might think, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this because if I rearrange the blocks, it's not going to decrypt into anything good at all because the blocks are dependent on each other. They have to be in the right order or it won't decrypt. But there's another flaw in this one. So again, you can have meaningful data encrypted and you just have what appears to be random hex. But what you do is you modify one block of ciphertext, just like one bit. Now that turns this into random junk, but in the decryption, it's taking the ciphertext and XORing it here, so it changes only one byte here, and the rest of it is not ruined. I, because the decryption goes the other way, from the end back. So this means I can, if I just change one bit at a time at the ciphertext, I will be making meaningful changes here of just one character. So user ID equals 155, the 5 will just change to another character. So if I try all 256 values, some of them are going to be a null or an ampersand or a zero, whatever character I want. A lot of them are meaningful. That's the attack on this one. So you just uh, change one byte at a time through various values, and some of those altered blocks will now have meaningful data in them. Yeah? So you're, so you're, you're proposing a trial and error process, but we don't know how many iterations. Well, you do, because that's the thing. It's not an infinite number, because all you do is you change one byte, and there's only 256 values. Then you try the next and the next. That's not too many. And so this is what you get. This turns into junk, but some byte changes over there. So you just try it and see app equals ebank, various random things happen. But here's the UID. Sooner or later, I'm changing the byte in the UID here. And if I change that to a semicolon, this is now UID equals 2. You can eventually hit a meaningful number there. Some of them destroy things, and they'll, the server will not talk to you. But a lot of them destroy things you're not using, and it doesn't matter. And once some of those byte changes are actually going to change the meaningful parameter, so you can often get away with it. This is why encryption was not really designed for this issue. People use it anyway because they don't understand, but it's not really good for this. And Burp has some tools to help you do that. It has an automatic intruder that will flip each bit one by one going through. That'll be eight requests for byte if you just flip one bit, so it really won't take long. Eight times the number of bytes in the ciphertext. That'll tell you if the result is um, some, most of them are invalid, but some of them will actually reach accounts of users and it'll pile them up. So you see up here I get me, 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 and here I got unknown user, and here I got Peter and John. Two of them turned into real other users. So I'm able to prove I can do horizontal privilege escalation, and if I was lucky enough to get root, I'd be vertical privilege escalation. All right, here's another fun thing. Um, once you have an encryption routine on the server, they will often reuse it for other purposes, like to encrypt your um, password reset cookie or your advertising cookie or something. So you can often find another part of the page where you can feed in data, which it will encrypt for you. So you can feed in the data you want. User ID equals one, admin equals true, and it will encrypt that for you, thinking it's like your advertising token, and give you the ciphertext, and often that is the same key in the same ciphertext. Mm. So you can just use it against itself. This often works with malware. In malware analysis, you often do this. You have something encrypted, you find the encryption module, you don't even figure out how it works, you just feed in what you need into that, find the decryption module and just use it. It works in PHP malware too. I've done that quite a bit, obfuscated PHP. So I got some codes about that. So what token generation system makes replay attacks easy? All right, if you encrypt meaningful data, then I can just copy somebody else's data and replay it without the key, and I'll get in their account. If you didn't put in some kind of anti-CSRF token, like their MAC address or something, uh, which system can be exploited by rearranging blocks of ciphertext? Yeah, it's ECB, encrypts each block independently, so you can just rearrange the blocks. And it's the same thing as rearranging those blocks of plain text. So which one can you exploit by changing a single byte? That's cipher block chaining. A single byte changing input will create one block of garbage and change one byte in the next block. So you can change one digit in a number or otherwise get meaningful results. All right, which one uses one block of data to influence the encryption of the next block? 
That's cipher block chaining. Good. All right. So, token handling. We haven't talked about yet. One common belief is that SSL will remove all the weaknesses in token handling, but this is, of course, not true. It provides encryption and authentication, so you know what server you're sending it to, and it's encrypted with a key that is very hard to steal. But there are attacks that, that cause the source to send the data to the wrong place. And uh, so this, this stops you from sniffing it, but you can, um, for example, the token might be transmitted without encryption because not all of your website is HTTPS. That's one way. Um, then you can sniff it anywhere, of course. It's going in plain text all over the place. Um, you might be able to, um, another thing people do is use uh, two-factor authentication. And that would do it. But in here, you could still do it because um, you can steal a session token and hijack an authenticated session because once they do the two-factor authentication, they typically go down to one session token and you could steal that. Now, even if it's sent over HTTPS, there are attacks like stealing the phone and reading it from the phone memory and like finding a cross-site scripting vulnerability on the page that tricks them into sending a copy of that to you. Um, so uh, this is what Gmail did. They used HTTP first part on the page and that sent your token in a way it could be stolen. Um, and there may be some page somewhere like that. How um, many hacks before they upgraded to to Raptor? I, a lot of people, <laughs> including me. Um, anyway, so uh, you may keep using the same token. The back button. A lot of people go to an HTTP website. They redirect to an HTTPS website. And if you, if the user clicks the back button, it will go back to the HTTP site and send the click the out in, in oh. plain text. And by the way, you can sometimes press the button for them with JavaScript. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so that's one way it would be exposed. Um, SSL strip you used in a hacking class. This is a proxy that downgrades HTTPS to HTTP, so you load the page and it looks good, but in fact it's not encrypted on the LAN, it's only encrypted on the WAN. Uh, this works unless you're using one of the top 1,000 websites in Chrome. Chrome now knows that they should be secure and it will not load them over HTTP at all. But only the biggest websites have that defense because most websites are not yet ready to commit to being 100% HTTPS forever, and that's what you must do. Because after this, nobody can see your ads or anything over HTTP, so many companies are not ready to do that yet. Yeah? The HTTPS Anywhere Chrome extension uh, defend against this? That, that does the similar thing, yeah. But uh, not every website works through it. Okay. So that's an issue, yeah. The HTTPS web extension that was about. Then, so mixed content is the issue here. A lot of people have pages that are HTTPS, but there is some HTTP content on the page. Oh. And if there is any HTTP content on the page, the page is unsafe because that content could bring in an attack or JavaScript or something. Um, so it's it's dangerous, and it, that, that can leak the session token out. So browsers now block mixed sites, and uh, I think soon Chrome is going to and Firefox are going to warn anybody from mixed sites, if you try to put any data into a mixed site, and I think next month Chrome is going to warn you of any HTTP page that is just unsafe, even if you're not logging in. They're getting pretty aggressive about it. Social engineering is another way. Um, the app uses HTTPS for every page, so you send them a link by email or something, and when they click that link, it makes a connection to some page, um, and that may send a session token over HTTP. You may be able to trick the browser into thinking that you're a different site. Um, so here's how you do this. Walk through the app from the start page to log in all the functionality, note every URL, note every session token, and especially notice when it changes from HTTP to HTTPS. Most websites like Amazon are a mixture of both. And when I first found this out, I thought that Amazon was vulnerable and I thought we were going to have great time at the Wall of Sheep hacking into Amazon, but I found that they were doing it intentionally and they were pretty smart. The tokens sent in clear text, you couldn't make a purchase with those. All they did was target ads. So I could find your name, but not your address, and I could not buy a book with the token sent in plain text. They had different tokens set at different levels of security, and they knew it, and they were carefully not putting the really important stuff in the plain text token. And when I complained and said they should just use HTTPS, Dan Kaminsky spoke up on <laughs> Twitter, and he said, that's asking too much, and we had an interesting argument back and forth among people. I said they should all do it, and he said, no, actually, when you're a big company, you have a lot of business partners, it's actually not easy to go up to HTTPS, and it's, it's probably correct that they are mixed for a while while they get there. What about uh, the private mode? 
Does that help you any? Um, there was That's a recent, there was consider. recent news article saying that it doesn't do much. I've always what? wondered about it. I've never tested it. Sure, it did. The recent uh, there is a recent news article last week where someone finally tested it and they said it didn't really protect you much. It, Which it, article? Uh, it's on my news. I forget. But they someone tested it and they said it's not protecting you very well. It does not send cookies in private mode. Okay. But uh, there are other things it does. Oh, it's, I always thought it's probably not very good. Better than nothing. Better than nothing. Okay. Anyway, so HTTP history is here. You can see what's sent up that way. Uh, now, if you set the secure flag on a cookie when you set it, then the browser will never send that cookie over HTTP at all, which is a pretty good idea. So let's take a look at a few of these. I made a web page to demonstrate them. So here in Firefox, I'm done with Amazon. So here we are, vulnerable cookies. So here I have a login page. Let me blow it up. And uh, there's an account with the name of user and a password of password. So first, I'm going to clear all my old cookies. Let's go to Options, Preferences, and search for Cookies, and delete my history. Um, clear your history for the last today. There. OK, now I got nothing from today. So let's go here. Get rid of that. OK, so here I am. I'm going to log in through Burp. Let me clear my, my Burp history so I can see they're just the recent traffic and not all this old stuff. Okay, so there's my proxy, nice and empty. I now log in with user password. And it tells me, welcome user, so I'm in. Let's see what happened. This is my website, of course, so it's very simple. I sent a post request with user and password in it, and Cloudflare created this automatically generated ID, which is not authenticating me. It has to do with Cloudflare protecting the site. And then the response to that set a cookie. There's a set cookie, and it put the username in a cookie, which is not a best practice, but this website is intended to make it easy to analyze. And it did not set anything else important about the cookie. All it did was set an expiration date for the cookie. It didn't make it secure or anything. So now I have a cookie that has my user in it. And now, um, then it loads the welcome page. And when I sent that up to the server, it sent the cookie with my name. And when the server responded, it put my user name on the page, which it got from the cookie. So that's how my little login page works. Now, if I go back, I can try doing JavaScript to alert document cookie, and it will pop up username equals user. Because this is what a cross-site scripting attacker might do. They could just send me a URL, like a tiny URL, that opens a page that has scripts in it that will send the cookie somewhere, and I could get my cookie stolen in such a case. So let's try a secure cookie. This is an insecure site, HTTPS, Attack Direct. So if I go down here and I log in with user password at the secure page, oh, first I'm going to clear my old cookies, or it's going to see my old cookie, which is annoying. So go to Preferences, Cookie. Clear your recent history. I'll clear from the last hour. OK, now I don't have a cookie anymore. And to make sure of that, I'll alert. And now see there's nothing in here. So I don't have a cookie. Now I'm going to log in again. And when I get here, undefined index username, it can't print my name. Now that is, let's look and find out why that happened in Burp. Here I am post, the request logs in with a valid username and password. And the response sets a cookie. Set cookie, but it sets it as secure and HTTP only. So when I go to the next page here to get the page, it doesn't send the cookie up because this is an HTTP page. So even though it sent me a cookie, it won't send it to the next request. So now the user does not know who I am. It, it sent the Cloudflare cookie, but it did not send the username cookie. So I didn't really get in. It now just gives me an error message instead of letting me log in. If I want to log in, I have to use the secure page, which is attack. So let's do that. If I go to it, oh, by the way, while we're here, let's try the JavaScript thing. It won't appear here, even though, um, because in the first place, it's not HTTPS, but also it's, it's, uh, it's HTTP only, so JavaScript cannot access that value. So let's come in on a secure page with attack, which goes through Cloudflare's HTTPS system, so it, now it's encrypted. And now, if I log in here, it now knows who I am. And if I go look here, I've already set it to trust this proxy so I can man in the middle HTTPS. So now, when I log in here, I send up the username and password, and the server's response set the cookie and made it secure. 
And when I went to the, it re then redirected me to the next page. And so it did a request here. And in that request, it did send up the username because it was secure. So the response was able to um, send me the username in the page. Somehow I followed off the track there, but it doesn't matter. Now, if I go back here, I have a cookie and it's working, but if I use JavaScript, I still can't get it. No one can steal it with cross-site scripting because it's HTTP only. All right. So that's what that is for. So you can see that fun stuff. And uh, all right. That's setting a secure cookie, transmitting a secure cookie, and so on. All right. All right. HTTP only can't be used by JavaScript. All right. Now, HTTP strict transport security is a header that makes you a lot safer, and people should be using it. It's now up to, I think, 8% of kites are using it. I learned this from that Troy Hunt video. It's not in your textbook. This came after your book was written. This is the modern, this is the recommended way to secure your site now. You add this to the header, and you tell it to only load pages over a secure connection. And since it's under your control, you can undo it if you later decide to partner with some company that has to serve ads over HTTP. So right now, 6% of websites are using this. It's been growing gradually. This is for the last year or so as it gradually grows. Not very many sites use it. But you can control it here, and you can say how long to load my page over HTTPS. So a day or a year or something. And then um, if I change my mind next month and get bought out by somebody that doesn't use HTTPS, I can take that header off my server, and people will see able to still load the page pretty soon. Um, there is a, another version of it that tells Chrome to add you to the permitted HTTPS list, and that cannot be undone. So you can only do that once you're ready to make a commitment to be HTTPS now and forever on everything. And that's a lot to ask your management typically. How do you know you're not going to decide to get a contract next month with somebody that hasn't upgraded yet? Only a few websites are ready for that change. But a lot of them are ready to use this. All right, so uh, disclosure of token in logs is another issue. This is not as common, but it can happen. Uh, logs are visible often to attackers. Often logs are publicly visible. And then uh, you might see them in logs. Some, And so you can look for in URL J session ID and find a bunch of publicly visible servers here. I found 74 million. They're not all logs, but some of them are. Looks like the British Library has logs visible. Let's take a look at that. Especially if it's overseas, I don't think they can prosecute me. Ah. In URL, J session ID. There was an article on Twitter. Google in URL, J session ID. And uh, D zone, I think it's a gaming website or something. Random login <laughs> failed, getting rid of it. Uh, session D project. Just save it? No, and they change them. Um, and what happens is these Google dorks become known and they become less and less effective. I may not have found any real ones. See, might should be pages. These are just pages about it. But um, another one that used to be was Elma. Let's try that. Elma is a Microsoft um, log viewer. And I found, I think, last time I did this, Toyota was using Elma. Um, and you could totally find uh, their logs here. Um, I may not be able, maybe these, these are really old ones. Maybe people have finally wised up about some of these. Uh, avoid logging sensitive information with Elma. You know, a lot of people are onto this. Um, I'm not finding a good one in the first few pages. So anyway, there's a time when you could easily find visible logs. And then all you do is send a user a malformed link. It'll make an error, go in the log, and have their cookie totally get into people's sites. Troy Hunt did that a few years ago on Twitter to show it to us at a Toyota website, I think. All right, so your session ID, if you put it in the URL, it'll be in the favorites, in the web server logs, in the browser logs, in the reverse proxy logs. It'll even appear in the referrer. So all I have to do is email you a link, and when you click on the link, it'll put the URL of where you came from in the referrer. But the referrer always seemed to me insane and unsanitary. It tells me what you're doing on another site that has nothing to do with this site. That's kind of rude, and that's, and that's what it does. So that's why you should never put anything sensitive in the URL, because it is just sprayed all over the place. It's not supposed to have secrets. Yeah. So um, here you are, request to this place, but the referrer has the previous place, and it might have a session cookie right there. And if it does, then you're just spraying it all over the place, sending it to other people. I don't even need to use cross-site scripting, so that's a referrer attack. Um, I just send email, 
containing a URL, and your web server will visit it. All right. So um, another thing people do often is let you have two sessions open at the same time. Uh, this is commonly done so you can log in multiple times, but you should have separate tokens for each one. But a lot of people use the same token over on multiple devices because they haven't really understood the logic of a session. So here's a token value, another one that decodes to this. But the app will accept, so it's got a user and it's got some kind of token, but it'll actually accept the same token with a different username because it has two stages. First is the section, is the token valid, then is the user valid. This is fairly common, that you have a series of tests and it's possible to pass them out of order. Uh, that was the case with a major vulnerability in the, um, the system that sends security data over the internet that we just had in the news articles this week uh, for web apps. I'm forgetting the name of it, but there's something that sends secure SAML. The SAML vulnerabilities that were known several years ago on almost every SAML platform had this kind of flow problem. You could send two SAML assertions with your, a SAML tells the server what your permissions are, which is kind of nuts, like the ASP view state, but that's how it works and it's how most uh, phone apps work. So I would send it my username, I'm Sam, here's my permissions, I'm not the administrator, then I add another set of permissions after it that say I am the administrator. Mm -hmm. and I. 10 out of the 12 major platforms had the same error, where first they would verify the username, then they would verify the permission, then they would go to the next permission and just apply it without checking back to make sure it matched the username. So you could totally elevate yourself to administrator this way. <laughs> it's, it's fairly common. It's the same thing as having pages, like you log in, then you buy the product, then you put in your credit card number, then you ship the product. I can just skip to shipping without really buying it first if you don't think it through. So, all right, so a session might stay valid for a long time. Most modern web apps, they seem to stay valid forever because you never have to make the user type in their uh, password again on the phone. Uh, the logout typically does nothing but delete the cookie out of their browser. Um, so I went and found, uh, I've heard about this for Office 365, so I went and tested a bunch of them. And I did this at DEF CON and made videos and everything. I'm getting into my Chase account. And uh, most uh, half of the websites I went to had this vulnerability where cookies remain vulnerable even after you log out. You can just steal the cookie, log out, replay the cookie, and get back in. So if I steal your phone or I steal your cookie, by the way, you're really screwed. If I steal your Chase cookie, well, Chase is actually not a good reason for nothing, but if I steal your cookie, then if you change your password, the old cookie still works. It's worse than stealing your password, except, of course, your password reuse. Now, American Express and Chase actually have a 10-minute timeout. So that limits the damage there. It's defense in depth. But most other things like Office 365 do not. I was, in fact, uh, using that as a backup for my password. If I forget my password, I can just replay that old cookie I said <laughs> to get in. But this is not the way it should be, but that's the way it is. About half the websites I tested were like that. I had a big list of them and demonstrated it at DEF CON and stuff. Isn't it so um, now you use the last live account? What's that? Now that you use, la now that you use last, the last pass. Uh, yeah. That means I have still all the passwords. Vulnerable even when you log, can you still do the? I probably could. Yes, I haven't tested it in a while, but nobody seemed to care about fixing it. The only company that actually understood my reports and fixed it was Cloudflare, because Cloudflare is very smart yeah. and very security conscious. They had this vulnerability. When I told them, they fixed it within a day. Everybody else just sort of told me to shut up and go away. It's usually what you get when you tell people. But 365 isn't that in the Microsoft Mail free mail system? So did you try it right there? I, did you, I did the pay one, the college one. It was vulnerable. Oh, the college one? That was the original report. Somebody else found that, and that hit the headline news. So I saw it, and then I started testing everything, and about half of every website was I tried it with the live.com, and then the officers inside the yeah, live. I haven't checked it in a few years. This was about 2014 when I found this. It may have changed somewhat now. Anyway, so you can do cookie theft. You can do session fixation. This is often fun. Yeah. You remember how you have... I mean, it said you often have a session token before you log in, so you can do things like personalized ads. Sometimes when you log in, it continues using the same token. So what I can do is send you a link to click, and when you click it, it specifies the session token. And then when you log in, it keeps using the same session token. I say, like, here, use this number. Great, thanks for using that number. Now I can just sail right in. <laughs> That's called session fixation, and it works pretty often because people just don't think it through. They don't always generate a new random number. If they see a number already in the request, they say, well, they must have already gotten the number from some other part of my website. I'll just use that number. Right, and cross-site request forgery, where I trick a user into submitting a request. Um, 
containing a cookie that goes to an attacker server or is used out of context, like I can put a link that causes you to go to the other tab in your browser and buy my book on Amazon, if you happen to be logged in, or you can send a request to my server that sends your cookie up. So cookies have a scope. You can specify what domain can see the cookie. Um, by default, all subdomains are included. So if I have a cookie set by games.samsclass.info, it will also be sent to foo.games.samsclass.info, but it won't be sent to samsclass.info. Not because that's not considered a subdomain. So if the app at waapp.com sets this cookie with a domain of waapp.com, everything that ends in waapp.com, including bar.waapp.com, will get that cookie. You can only set a cookie for the same domain that the page is at, or a parent domain. You cannot set a cookie to something like .com, that would be awful. So blogs.com might set a cookie for each user. Now, Joe and Sally are going to get that cookie. Everybody with a blog is going to get that cookie. So this is not good. I can steal tokens from other people uh, with, who read the attacker's blog. Sally can steal Joe's token. So what's better is make them log in at www.blogs.com. Now when they go to joe.com, that token will not go. So that's why it's useful to have these early domain names here so you can separate out the cookies. Because that essentially designates the, the ceiling Yes. Which. Now they could only, now they, if I set a cookie at www.blogs.com, they would see it if they went to joe.www.blogs.com, but they won't see it if they go to joe.blogs.com. And that's what you want. So the system is designed so you can control where the cookies are going, but you have to understand the system and use it correctly. All right. So if I, you can make a path equal apps, and now it will submit it to all subdirectories, the apps path. Uh, this turns out to be easily attacked by making a handle to a JavaScript window that refers to a domain there. Uh, this is the problem. All these things rely on the same origin policy. That's the, fundamental, uh, that's the fundamental of all browser security, and it is very easy to trick a browser into thinking it's going to one site when it's really going to another and violate the same origin policy. All right, so to secure, session manage it. Make strong tokens, protect them from creation to disposal. Uh, use a large set of random values with plenty of entropy so the token is not predictable. There should not be any meaning or structure. It should just be a random number. It should not be an encrypted username or anything else. Um, remember that a lot of random functions are predictable and not really random, which fools a lot of developers. It just seems like a, an unnecessary booby trap they put in languages. Why well, give you a function that doesn't work, but most of them do. Um, so source IP, port number, user agent, header, milliseconds, these are possible sources of entropy. Adding a secret known only to the server and then hashing it all and changing the secret on each reboot is a good way to make something that should be pretty unpredictable. Um, only send things over HTTPS, set them for secure and HTTP only to stop to side channels. Um, don't put the tokens in the URL. <laughs> Have a logout function that actually invalidates that token on the server. So even if somebody stole the token, it will no longer work. Um, sessions should expire after a period of time. Uh, don't allow concurrent logins. Those are often unpractical for business reasons. Um, if you have diagnostic or administrative functions, you probably don't want to let them have a remember me for a high value account like that. Force them to log in more it would be a lot better. Um, so if somebody manages to steal the administrator's token, it's not going to work for long. Um, use your domain and path to limit where the cookie goes. Get rid of the cross-site scripting. Boy, that's easier said than done. 80% of websites have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. And if you report them, nobody even cares. There's whole websites just mocking them, and people just don't even bother to fix it in most cases. Um, that's what's wrong with banks, right? Because you can log in uh, to log in twice. Yes. To a different Most computer. banks I know actually make you type in the password and actually time you out. Uh, they're a lot better than other sites in that regard. They didn't used to be, but these days most of them do. But did you try to log into Chase from your two different computers? Oh, it lets you do that, I think. It does? I, I did not test it. I haven't tested it in a long time. Just try it. Does have a ten minute, it does have a 10 minute timeout, though. Okay. So that helps cover a multitude of sins. Mm. Um, so two factor authentication is very good. Uh, this makes a lot of these techniques not work. Um, hidden fields are better than session cookies Ooh. because that means they have to be coming from your page. They can't be in something like Burp Intruder sending something up. And that hidden field, you can have a field that changes every time there, creating, and always create a fresh session. Don't reuse a token that came from the user. 
or you're vulnerable to section fixation. Per page tokens are useful to make sure that people actually access your pages in order. So here's how that works. I have these long random numbers created on each page. So when I go to page one, it created a token it put on the page, which went up. And when I went to page two, it created another token. And although these numbers look random, my server knows what they should be. So I make sure it is your browser on this page, then it is your browser on that page, your browser on that page, not some burp intruder or stolen cookie or something. That's the way you make sure that it's the same person going in the right order through your pages. Yeah. So it's a system of, of dependencies. So is there a, a, a simple name for that necessary set of dependencies? Uh, no, but it's a state table. And what you do is each time you get data, you validate it all, including the per page cookie, which makes sure that this page actually is tied into that session, which was in progress. And if you, if you get anything out of order, or not matching the right user to the right session, then you cancel it and make them start over. Wouldn't that basically be blockchain? Uh, no, a blockchain is a data structure that makes multiple copies on different computers oh, sure. to make it hard so to forge. That's, that's, this is just a state that's table that's where you pass from one state to the next. Uh, the dependency part that got me. Yeah, it's like that in that regard, yeah. The blockchain has another, had the hashes actually verify the contents, and that's not the case here. These are just random numbers. Um, All right. Yeah. I'm just curious. I'm trying to visualize for a, a, a single sign-on environment. Yeah. How does well, this is not for a thing like sign-on that happens all at once. This is for something like shopping, where first you log in, okay. then you put in your credit card number, then you send up your cart, then you put in your shipping address, then you verify your shipping address, then you buy it. And I want to make sure that you did those things in order, and you did them all from the same browser, and yeah. not then somebody, somebody else didn't steal your token and replay it. So Jump. then each oh, one of those pages, every time you view the page, it's different than everybody else's page because I put this random hidden field in there. Mm -hmm. And when you submit it, I make sure that random hidden field is the one I sent you. And on the next page, I make sure it's the one I sent you in the right order. And nobody can predict it or impersonate you. So now if somebody steals a token from your machine, they are not able to replay it from another machine or at another time and buy a product. That's the idea. So all it needs is to personalize each page and then verify that personalization. So I know this is a real user going through my steps in order, buying the product, not an attacker sending multiple requests to like guess the token or something. That's why it's surprising how that Amazon let me do what I just did. You know, they could totally prevent it with this kind of logic. They should not have accepted the same request with the same cookie 10 times with different fields missing. That's kind of sloppy. The Amazon is pretty smart, so I imagine they've thought about this. But in itself, that was a weakness, and it did let me find out which token mattered, which is information that they don't necessarily want me to have. So I say log these things. If you get invalid requests, this should raise IDS alerts. You should block those users, freeze those accounts, that sort of thing. You should regard this as an attack and respond to it instead of just ignoring it and trying to sanitize data and keep going to try to sell a product to somebody that is obviously a hacker and not a real customer. So terminate a session. If you get a modified hidden form field or a query string, if you get strings that are attached, like apostrophes in them and stuff like that, things that fail validation checks, like you have a form that only lets you put in 10 digits, some clown is using burp and putting in 20, you should just kick them out of their session. Now, obviously, they're an evil guy. Um, and that's the game. It's, you can, these attacks are not particularly subtle. But people just aren't even looking. So I got this, and then I want to just uh, do a little bit of a walkthrough through some of the projects, because you do this encryption stuff, which is pretty good fun. So what method of token theft does HTTPS prevent? OK, the only thing it stops is sniffing. The other three attacks all work just fine. So that's pretty gruesome. What defense prevents users from clicking through an SSL warning? Something I forgot to mention earlier, but I'll bring it up after this. So you make all these questions, or someone else helped you? <laughs> I made them up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, HSTS does that. I mentioned before, it forces you to load the page over secure, but it also means if you have like BERT, you will not get the option to click through and approve the certificate, yeah. which is because it really should be loaded over real HTTPS for my server. That's what I said. So that's a reason. That's probably the main benefit. It'll stop man in the middle attacks in progress. So what defense protects cookies from theft via JavaScript? 
which is typically what you do with cross-site scripting. Okay, that's HTTP only. This stops that. SSL strip is the most common answer, but that's an attack, not a defense. All right. Um, what should the logout button do? All right, it should cancel the session on the server. What it often does is just delete the cookie from the browser, and that's not good enough. That does stop the next user of your computer from getting in your account, which is probably all the end user thinks about, but it doesn't stop the person who stole your cookie from getting in your account. So what kind of session token is not sent on every request? The hidden field is sent from the server in the HTTP, HTML of that page. And it, it's not only going to be there if you put it on that page, so it's appropriate for like a per page token. When the server requires a request with a modified hidden form field, what should it do? All right, terminate the session. That is a hacker. That's not a legitimate user. You should not do business with that person. They are up to no good. So I just want to point you to some projects. Um, and I think I'll demonstrate a bit of it here. Uh, if you go here and go down here, here's the encryption one. So I can log in with user and password. And when I do, I get in here. Now I put the encrypted here just to make this easy. This is encrypted with electronic codebook. Here's the plain text and there's the hex. You could have got it from burp, but I made it easy. And it's broken up into blocks of text. So you see, I have a random number here. I have an app equals token three. I have a username equals user. I have a user ID equals five. So the, the account I gave you logs in as user ID five. And your goal is to log in as user ID number one. And you do not know the key. So you can't decrypt this. And you don't have to because you can see that the username is here. So I can, if I go to make a five digit username, Instead of a four character username, what's going to happen here? This is going to take another character, so it's going to be UID equals and it will end this block. So all I have to do is start with a five letter username and then copy random blocks down here, hoping to get one that starts with one. And notice here I have a five digit random number that puts a number there. So if I take this block and put it here, and just try it 10 or 20 times, I'll get lucky, and one of them will be one. Let me show you, if you add one to the username and make it user R instead of user, now it is user ID equals. And this is now zero, which is not valid, but I just need a one. So now I keep, need to keep using this name and I need to find the encryption that has one in it. So to do that, I just go back and forward. That's a seven, back and forward. That's a seven, keep logging in. It's yes. random each time, now it's a three. Sooner or later, I'll find a one. And then I'll have a block of text here that starts with one ampersand, and I can just put it down here, and I'll be user ID one. That's what I mean. Even though I can't decrypt it, I can still hack it. So that's good, clean fun. And here's the ECB one. So I log in with user and password, and it encrypts all that stuff um, here. And what you have to do is modify the ciphertext byte by byte to make random changes until you get lucky and you get in with a different user ID. And so I made a couple projects for you to do, proving that you can do those things. Um, that's 129S projects. This one's exploiting ECB, and the other one is extra credit and worth a lot of money. Uh, a lot of points, not money. But, um, this one here, um, there, 35 points I made it. I'm not sure, I think only like one or two students ever did it last time. That second one was pretty hard. But so here, this one is pretty easy. You open this site, get the break, and then you can just see. This shows you how to do what I just told you. This is pretty easy. You see what you're doing? You just need a five letter username and then copy the data and shift it around. And you can do it inside Burp. There are instructions here how to get into Burp and rearrange the data inside Burp to log in. So this is the required one. You can just follow the steps. This one here is tougher. 
Let's see if I can get to the page. The extra credit project yet? The extra credit project is tougher. 35 what, points? Yeah, what you have to do is you have to um, take the encrypted token, capture it, and then modify it bit by bit. And Burke supposedly can do it for you, but I think you don't get that in the free version. Yep. So unless you want to spend 300 bucks, you're not going to do it with Burp, so I would do it with Python. That's what I did. But that's why it's pretty tough. You've got to be able you to be only write a little Python script, but if you have to modify every bit until you find a combination that will actually let you log in with another valid user ID. And it's not that rare. So um, you can do it. That's horizontal privilege escalation in this one. And by the way, if you're really ambitious, I have a third one ready to go, and I haven't even written the project yet. I think I did it after the end of class last time. But just for completion, I put it in here. This is the one with DES CBC. Um, this is, oh, this is electronic code book. Pardon me. This is the one where you just have to rearrange the blocks. But you don't have that decryption thing. This is the one with CBC where you have to change the bits one by one. And I didn't even write a project for it, but the same logic should apply. So both of those other more advanced attacks, you can practice them on this system if you want to. But these were not very popular projects in the past. Yeah, but if you're, the kind, if you're in like the 140 class and you're trying to do CTFs and stuff, then you might be up to this stuff. It's not uh, for the average student that's just taking this class. But it is, if you're up to the CTFs and you want to be on the CPTC and get the certification for pen testers, OSCP, then you should be up to doing things like this. But that's considerably beyond this course. But it is worth extra credit if you get it working. Any questions about anything? Well, that's enough for today. I'll just clean up and I'll take a look in the hand and see if anybody needs help on projects.